Well, thank you very much for uh, uh, inviting me here. Uh, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, sustainability is there across what we hear, across boardrooms, across management, uh, across academia, and as well as consulting. It's a important topic. We have, uh, you know, esteemed panelists here covering uh, a wide variety of industries, right from construction, building materials, to infrastructure, to uh, electrification, to uh, as well as consumer brands, right? So, uh, uh, what we want to hear, I, I know we are <laughs> we are already running late, but we will try and keep it simple. Uh, what I would like to hear, and it's a, how innovation or technology is driving sustainability across all these industries. Uh, what we will do is, while we, you know, ask the panelists to introduce themselves, I'll I'll also then, uh, you know, drive the first question towards it as well. So uh, let me uh, let me start with Nikhil, right? Uh, he is, he is the you know, CEO of Gentari Mobility, uh, electrification, driving electrification of fleets across the country or you know, driving sustainability or decarbonization across fleets. Uh, Nikhil, uh, at least while you know, we want also for the audience to introduce what the company does and how technology is playing an important role in the way you are operating in the country, right? So that I think is the first and then we'll move on to the other panelists. Right. Um, Thanks, Prashant. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> um, um, so um, um, let me first introduce myself. Yeah. Uh, I'm Nikhil Thomas. I uh, head the or uh, lead the uh, green mobility team at Gentari India. Um, I've um, um, you know uh, experience in multiple domains, spanning from automotive, um, vehicle leasing, e-commerce, um, uh, startups. I actually founded a startup called Truckeasy in the last uh, mile uh, delivery space. Uh, and then now um, uh, in the EV e eco ecosystem uh, through Gentari, right? Uh, Gentari uh, is, is basically was founded uh, to solve for clean energy solutions, you know, across, um, um, uh, in fact, clean energy solutions which are reliable, right? Uh, scalable and cost effective uh, across Asia, Asia Pacific markets and India markets, right? Uh, we in, in Gentari basically operate uh, out of three core pillars, um, uh, which is renewable energy, hydrogen, and uh, green mobility. And green mobility is what I had. Uh, so um, if, you, if you look at uh, our path, right? Uh, in fact, I'll just talk about some history. Uh, uh, the last two centuries right, uh, have been explosive in terms of growth. Right, um, mankind, because uh, a big thing happened. Uh, the industrial re revolution happened uh, in uh, somewhere around 1700s, 1800s, right? And and that was a global phenomenon, and it, it had a global impact, right? And um, 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 I think, and and all industries across all domains uh, uh, were growing at a frantic pace. Uh, but the problem there is, you know, uh, uh, the major energy source which uh, was used for this growth was hydrocarbons, right? And uh, I think, you know, all industries were mercilessly polluting, uh, not knowing the kind of impact uh, uh, that they were uh, creating, right? Uh, but fortunately, you know, now we've all woken up and we have realized, hey, if we keep on doing this, there won't be a planet to live on, right? So sustainability now has taken, taken uh, front seat and, and um, uh, that's where, you know, um, um, Gentari, you know, stands at the forefront, um, um, you know, making this transition, right? Uh, uh, so in, in green mobility, just to touch upon green mobility, what, what we do, we, uh, we electrify the ecosystem, right? Uh, we lease out uh, electric vehicles to uh, uh, B2B customers, fleet operators, and we, we set up charging infrastructure for them. So it's not just vehicles that we are providing. We also provide means to energize these vehicles, right? And of course, a lot of value-added services are also provided. So we've got a digital platform which we recently launched called Gentari Go, which, which provides digital uh, uh, solutions for navigating these two business lines that we have created, right? Um, yeah, I think that's about yeah. it, yeah. Thank you, thanks for the introduction. Uh, Abhijit, let me come to you first and then uh, I'll go to Amrita. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Abhijit is uh, 
leading marketing and corporate strategy at uh, Infra Market. And Infra Market is a very interesting play in the uh, building construction infrastructure, right? Uh, I just wanted to obviously introduce yourself a bit and then talk about what Infra Market is doing. Uh, what is the genesis of Infra Market and how, how, how it has taken in the last seven, eight years of the journey and how you're using technology as a, as a lever to drive this growth uh, in the market. Thanks. So uh, I think uh, India is headed to become a trillion dollar economy and uh, we are looking at more than 50 smart cities coming up. So when we set up to uh, uh, put infra markets, ideologies in place and the reason for us to exist, in fact, we just had a session on purpose driving the brand. So the purpose that was driving us was trying to figure out how can we accelerate this, how can we make this seamless. And we realized that today, if you, whether you take an infrastructure project or whether you take a builder, the biggest problem that he faces in terms of delivering the project on time are on two fronts. One is obviously the financing part where his working capital gets stuck. But the core reason why his working capital gets stuck is when he does not get material on time. He needs steel from somebody else, cement from somebody else, and concrete from somebody else, till the end where he needs paint and, and everything all put together. So, so that was the genesis of this company. I think uh, we set up to uh, make this process seamless and easier. And today we can boast of clients like, say, even an LNT. We, we, Government of India is a big client for us, whether it's the Samriddhi Highway or the Mumbai Wali Ceiling. And any real estate player, starting from uh, uh, Loda to uh, this, uh, if we come to uh, DLF in Delhi or J. Kumar in or anywhere. So what we are trying to do is ensure that when he excavates, he gets concrete on time. And right from there, from concrete to steel to blocks, AC blocks, uh, which are a green product today and, and replacing till, if it's a builder, till modular kitchen. Today we boast of 300 manufacturing units of our own across all these eight different product categories. And as you were rightly saying, what, how is technology, so we are a tech, tech first company. We, we have a lot of in-house tech and I think the founders understood this, the new age founders, they understood this long back. Okay, this is an industry which is plagued with a lot of uh, deficiency in terms of the way the technology is integrated and if India has to move forward companies need to adopt that so so we realize that in infrastructure or in building construction material industry two or three bigger problems where maybe one is transparency you hardly knew what is the right price you hardly knew when is where is how do you get it quality maybe secondly and thirdly maybe commitment to timely delivery so all these three needed to be, so the third part we solved by having our own manufacturing units. In fact, today, uh, as I speak, we are a, not a very old organization, about a six-year-old organization, but what we started first, today we are number two player in the country, which is concrete after Ultratech, Inframarket, along with Inframarket and RDC, which are both. In fact, we are a house of brands and we, have, uh, we are number two in the concrete space. So we needed to stitch this all in technology, right from sourcing to supply chain, to even an architect, a dealer, who should be easily accessible to a consumer. So I think a lot of tech has got built at the back end. A lot of supply chain has got stretched. A lot of procurement has got stretched. And uh, while we operate as a house of brands on the ground, but the, at the back end, a lot of sourcing, like as I was telling, concrete, or even say a Shalimar Paints, which is our group company today. All of that, a lot of uh, companies that we have, three or four brands that we have in tiles, and sanitary sector. So all of that at the back end, sourcing a lot of it is common and we have staged that all through technology. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, Amrita, uh, you know, you are an FMCG leader, worked with number of companies and brands and building sustainability, uh, sustainable products, right? Uh, we just want to hear from you how FMCG brands, right, are, are incorporating sustainability into building their brand strategies, right? So that you know, we heard from them on the technology side, on the infra and, 
electrification. We want to hear from you on, let's move to the sustainability topic, how FMCG brands are doing today, what's the framework they are operating in, so on. Thank you, Prashant. And uh, of course, thanks uh, to the entrepreneur team for enabling us to be here. Uh, before I really delve deeper into that topic, um, I just wanted to kind of take maybe 20 seconds to stress on one point. Uh, so we were sitting in the audience, and um, this is the third panel that I saw. There were two more you know, panel discussions before this. And of course, uh, it is you know, sustainability that we're talking about in this panel. But very interestingly, in all the three panels, um, I was the only lady that I saw. So cheers to all the women who are sitting here in the auditorium. Uh, but uh, what I want to say is if we really want to talk about innovation and sustainability and technology, I think we need to have more women sitting not just there, but sitting here. So I hope the entrepreneur team is also listening because most entrepreneurs today are also women. And that's how we can really drive true innovation and ensure that all of these new age buzzwords become a reality. So sorry to digress, no, but that's, sustainability that's, that's is, an important one you know, a... in, it is kind of going to happen when we are more inclusive. So just yeah. wanted to make that point. Um, so I basically am uh, the chief marketing officer at Amway. Uh, I'm extremely passionate about the area of health, wellness, and sustainability. Uh, the three of these, you know, put together and in isolation are the most underpenetrated when it comes to consumers in India. So while we talk a lot about sustainability, CSR, and of course, infrastructure, manufacturing, supply chain, which need to kind of, you know, move or are already seeing a green revolution, uh, what we kind of tend to, you know, ignore is that Yes, technology innovation will enable all of that green revolution when it comes to building the infrastructure, changing our supply chains, our manufacturing units. All of that is happening and will happen. But it's consumers, basically, like you and me. All of us are consumers, right, of products. If we as consumers start changing our habits, which is the most difficult thing to change because Habit, as we know, is very difficult and doesn't change easily. Habits die hard, as they say. It's only when we accept products which are more sustainable, that's when all of the infrastructure, all of the manufacturing plants, all of the supply chain will make it more accessible and scalable. Let me just explain this in a bit to you. Why am I saying this? So if a company comes out with, say, a laundry detergent, Okay, which is extremely sustainable and it's green labeled and certified and all of that. But you still have a stain on your clothes. Will you wear that shirt and come here to this conference? I'm sure nobody will, right? So what it really means is that products which are going to be sustainable, they have the backing of the manufacturing which makes them sustainable, but they have to deliver on functionality as well. And are consumers like you and me going to accept those products if they have a little flaw? Obviously not. So I think it's a dual responsibility. One is on the manufacturers, you know, to ensure that the products are not just labeled or certified green, but they also deliver on the functionality, the durability, the usability, the convenience, the comfort, all of the things that you and me look for. But I think it's also the responsibility of we as consumers to accept and change. Let me give you another example. If today, in, in the lunch break, if I told you that this particular venue will not serve rice or wheat, which means no roti or chawal okay, in your meal, and we will serve millets to you, would you have that as part of your lunch? Maybe some of you would but I don't think many people would really appreciate that. And they would kind of say that I'm not going for this conference if I have to stay hungry and then attend the whole day's event, right? So what does that really mean? Habits die hard. So millets are the most sustainable, okay? They can drive green revolution, but they will be expensive. Why? Because there are no economies of scale. Because in this big auditorium, 
there would be one, two, or three, or maybe max to one, two percent of people who would accept and replace their rice or their roti with millet-based foods or bhakris made of millets. And that, actually, if that changes, that will drive economies of scale and go back into the supply chain, manufacturing, technology, infrastructure, and ensure the costs are lower. So it's a vicious cycle. And that's the side of you know, driving consumerization of sustainability, which is what uh, you know, I basically work on. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, uh, very interesting point. Even, even if someone eats millets today, it's changing 365 days becomes a real challenge, right? Uh, as for taste, as for, you know, people may you know, do it once a week, once a month, I don't know, but it becomes difficult because it's, it's a kind of thing, right? Uh, uh, Nikhil, uh, you know, earlier sessions also people talked about, you know, 15 rupees per kilometer to one rupee per kilometer. I don't know at what level you are in, but how are you, uh, you know, ensuring that you know, the high capex of initial vehicle cost and uh, uh, coming down to operating cost, lower operating cost. How are you managing that today? And how is, how do you see five years down the line, right? So, you know, there is an adoption issue as, uh, you know, Amrita talked about. We have also seen compared to other countries, our adoption in, in uh, electric vehicles is not as fast as it should be, right? And what will help it drive that adoption? Um, so, yeah, yeah uh, electric vehicles, if everybody adopted, I mean, it would have been a beautiful place. Uh, but uh, um, we, we see, I mean, there are multiple issues in adoption, but we kind of have narrowed down on two key things. One is your affordability, because EVs basically have a higher cap capex. And the second part is convenience, right? Now, don't worry, we've got solutions for you, right? Uh, uh, the capex through our leasing model, right, is something that we have uh, 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 kind of, so so let's say, for a B2B customer to, to outrightly go and purchase a vehicle, the capex amount is high. But when he chooses leasing, what we do is we kind of spread out uh, the, the capex over the entire useful life of a vehicle, right? So therefore, the initial investment that a potential EV user uh, would, would uh, um, you know, um, um, uh, sell, uh, shell out is, is minimal, right? Or, or as comparable to that of a combustion engine right? a vehicle, right? So through, through and, and it's not just the leasing part of it, right? We, we kind of provide flexible leasing options, right? So leasing options for one year, two years, and, and, and then, you know, based on, based on multiple use cases that, that, um, um, that's there prevalent in the market, right? So that kind of sort of takes care of the affordability factor. Now, affordability factor by, uh, um, uh, by uh, natural uh, uh, processes is also coming down. Now, when I say natural, it's obviously induced. Uh, as technology is is uh, improving by the day, by the year, right? Because battery tech, probably five years or ten years back, I think it was two x or three x of what what it is uh, today, right? Uh, uh, we have seen exponential decline in battery costs, uh, which has actually given us hope, you know, that that uh, at least we can buy through some subsidies offered by the government in the form of fame. We also predict that in the next three to five years that battery uh, prices will further uh, uh, drop probably um, to the extent of 50% that we see right now, right? Then that becomes affordable, right? But what we're trying to do is we're trying to fast track that. We can't just wait for five years and then say, hey, let's start polluting. I mean, let's keep polluting and then uh, five years we'll launch it, right? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to push, uh, pro provide stimulus for, for uh, uh, businesses and, and users to kind of shift as fast as possible, right? And that's, that's what we're providing through our leasing model, right? Uh, now, coming to the second part of convenience, right? Um, uh, convenience, let's assume, you know, you're, you're in Delhi, you want to go to Jaipur, right? Um, and, and um, uh, you know, you've got to, oh, forget Jaipur. Let's, let's say you have to run 400 kilometers, right? The, the uh, uh, typical car that, that's out there right now, the mass market cars, probably would run, uh, let's say, on a full charge, 300 uh, kilometers, right? So you won't get there, right? Now, just uh, uh, when, when, you are, when you are kind of looking at two scenarios, right? One scenario one, where you have your combustion vehicle, in, right? I think the last thing that would come to your mind is refueling, right? I mean, you won't even bother about um, uh, refueling a car, right? I mean, I don't think that would even be a problem statement when you kind of uh, go on these trips, right? But flip it with an electric vehicle, right? Then this comes, right? An electric vehicle which 
uh, has a range of 300 kilometers and you have to traverse 400 kilometers. Then it becomes a problem. That's what you call as range anxiety, right? And, and that's one of the biggest deterrents of EV adoption in, in not just in India, but across the globe, right? So that's what we're trying to solve through our uh, charge point as a business, right? Uh, which, which is providing or in, in installing charging points at, um, you know, at, at um, prime locations. So when I say prime, so there's a, there's a science behind adding um, um, charging infra, right? Uh, we don't just, uh, you know, install some charging infra and then, uh, you know, and, and pray for utilization to come, right? We look at, we look at a lot of data, right? And that's, that's what, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know which, which helps us in ensuring that we derive revenues also, right, from what we're installing, right? Because at the end of the day, we all have to make money, right? So uh, uh, we, we, we just can't, you know, install these um, uh, charging units wherever we uh, want to and then leave it uh, for luck or hope to kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, drive utilization, right? So, so that's, these are the two objectives uh, that uh, we have identified. And uh, on top of this, uh, we want to kind of create a lot of uh, user experience, right, while doing it. And that's why we've launched, you know, um, um, a digital platform, like I mentioned, Gentari Go, which, uh, which, which kind of gives that added convenience, right? Uh, convenience in the form of not just, you know, helping users discover uh, uh, charging, charging infrastructure, but also, uh, you know, providing um, uh, options for a user to, you know, um, install rooftop solars, uh, you know? And, and even if, if he's not an EV user, he can, he can also look at test driving EVs, right? So what, what we're basically trying to do is, it's not providing a single solution to a major problem, right? We're trying to address multiple facets of the problem, uh, and, and that's how this whole ecosystem can actually be developed, right? Yeah. Thank you, thank you for those uh, insights. Abhijit, uh, you know, you supply uh, materials, SKUs, which building materials, which probably we are not seeing, right? Most of it is hidden under, uh, you know, cement, concrete and stuff. What we see is only the, you know, uh, final interiors and so on. How are you, uh, you know, installing sustainable products into your own product portfolio as, as you have expanded a lot, as you're expanding across multiple categories as well as multiple products? How are you managing the sustainability part of uh, different things? Because probably consumer is not even aware of most of them. I think that's a very important point you're making. And in fact, uh, while you say this, it strikes to me that we are talking about, so we are so possessive about the car that we want to buy, whether it's today, it's, it's environment friendly, and we, we, are, we are, the, are we buying an EV vehicle? Are we contributing towards not only our uh, pocket, but also towards the society and environment in general? The kind of food that we are eating, are we eating millets or are we eating uh, non-healthy mm. food? But when, when you spend 70% of your life in your home, you are hardly bothered what went into making that home because you buy it from a builder, everything is behind the wall. And you are, you are not even conscious, what you are conscious about your home is the, the curtain color, the lounger that you will put, where the, the uh, TV should come, how your exterior yeah. should look. But infrastructure industry is 70% behind the wall and for us also. And we also have a B2B and a B2C uh, arm and, and we do understand that. And, and whether you're building your villa where you give it to an architect or a contractor or you're buying from a builder, I think that responsibility towards making it sustainable in all ways is extremely important. And again, as I told you, being a new age company, that was, that was I think, one of the core principles also for us. So, so therefore, if, so if I ask maybe 15 or 20 people in this room, the difference between cement and concrete. Hardly, I think maybe 2% would know that concrete is a mixture of cement, sand and, and aggregates. Because India, 99% of concrete is mixed at the site where you buy cement and, and you leave it to your contractor to mix it over there and then put it. So there was no responsibility there. I think that was the first product we took. And and just to give you a fair example, if you were to put a ceiling to your house and, and if this was your ceiling, it may take you 25 days when you mix it in, in at the site and allow your contractor to do. And time is also, by the way, 
uh, a resource which has to be used very sustainably. And if you get a ready mix concrete uh, truck, which is that that round trucks that keep yeah. moving, it will be put in three hours. So something which is going to take 20 days gets done in three hours. And qualitatively, the right amount of cement, sand, and aggregate. Aggregate are those chips, that stone chips that get mixed. So I think we started and we ensured that we are moving towards a global trend. More and more players today pushing. In, in fact, if you see the leader in cement today, they are also showing Shah Rukh Khan with a concrete transit mixer at the back end. So the industry is transforming towards becoming sustainable in terms of moving the product mix, even the bricks. So you, you saw a lot of bricks being used. Today, we are India's largest manufacturers of AAC blocks, which are fly ash blocks, which are replacing bricks. Those are those big uh, blocks that you see. I think the urban India has already moved. And outside any skyscraper, where which is under construction, you will see these brick blocks. But fly ash in itself is a byproduct of a steel plant. And it, it's very environment friendly. We are, in fact, a part of the Green Go Board Council, a uh, member of the IGBC. And, and, uh, and imagine the dead weight for the building. When you are putting something which is lightweight, like an AC block, not only are you putting a green product, but you are ensuring that all the walls, the dead weight is minimal, the susceptibility towards ma managing uh, long-term uh, wear and tear due to a lot of these hazards are there. And I can keep going on. There is, in each and every product we have inbuilt it. For example, our modular light, let me go to the last mile. We have our own MDF, our wood division, we focus more on MDF than the plywood, because plywood is all cutting trees, and, and the complete uh, Yamuna Nagar belt is filled with 400 to 500 factories, which are or inorganically, which are in the uh, uh, market manufacturing, means it's a complete unorganized market. Daily, the rates are cut, and tons and tons of trees are cut. But our understanding of MDF is that cheap Chinese wood that comes, which, which has some chura, busa, and all that. And, but medium density fiber wood comes in high density, medium density, and, and that's a more greener product than taking plywood. Our modular kitchens uses our own MDF, and we also, in our wood division, have promoted MDF in a bigger way. In fact, all the leaders today are moving towards building MDF as, and, and as I told you, there is sustainability in across all product categories. We just have to see it. We just need to ensure that when we are making our own homes or when we are into our own flats, we also ensure that that is a place that you spend 70 to 80 percent of your time. And therefore, you should choose the products wisely, which will ensure that your house lives a longer period. You have a better uh, life and, and you have a better uh, cost eff effectiveness plus whatever uh, time that you spend is more better spent. So I think yeah. that is very important. And it's being built by the government also in all the smart cities that you see. Yeah. I think they are taking this as a project, smart cities, apart from being smart in, in the tech format, are also being smart in a lot of uh, infrastructure that they are putting in. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think I have one last question, Amrita, for you. Uh, uh, you talked about functionality of a green product. Is a cost premium? Are consumers willing to pay a higher premium for a product which has similar functionality but it's still sustainable? Are consumers ready, or is it still a struggle like uh, you know a green vehicles, right? So people look at you know I want the same green product but at the at a price which is obviously affordable. Sure, I think it's a very interesting question, and I go back to you know what what I was saying earlier. Uh, so, Prashant, it's like, see, I think it's not about what is the cost of the product. What does it deliver? Does it deliver a similar or a better experience than a non-green product? Because what a consumer like you and me wants, as I said, whether it's green or not green, right? But just calm ke liye usko liya hai. Agar wo kaam kar dega, then obviously that product is in. So cost will come later. And therefore I said, it's the responsibility on both the manufacturer's side as well as the consumer
to come to a midpoint. Why do I say midpoint? Because yes, functionality, no compromise. We have to deliver on what is the core benefit you're buying that product, whether it's clothes, whether it's food, whether it's mobility, whether it's infrastructure, cement, whatever, because it has to deliver on the reason why you are buying that. So I don't think a green product can really compromise on the functionality and the usability, the durability, the comfort, the convenience. But yes, because of the economies of scale not being there today, because of the adoption of the consumer not being there, it is going to be a little more expensive because there are only a handful of people who are actually accepting, adopting, and using that product. So it's, it's, it's you know, a vicious cycle both ways. But very interestingly, I'm actually sandwiched between uh, the two gentlemen here, and I think it's a great opportunity to say this, that whether it's green mobility or it's green infrastructure, or we talk about any other product category, the adoption and, you know, as you asked about the cost or the premiumness, will not really come in the way once we create an ecosystem. And I think both my fellow panelists spoke about, in some way or the other, an ecosystem. Because we definitely need an ecosystem to ensure there is enhanced adoption. So it's a little bit of, you know, like, if I say, oh, I bought this and I found it really good. It's a green product. It's usable. It's very similar to my non-green product. Like, you know, Joe Mera regular detergent hai, ya Joe Mera regular aata hai. This, you know, it's a green millet based product, but uska taste badia hai. I didn't feel that mene aaj wheat nahi khaya, ya. I didn't feel ki mene XYZ product, jo regular mere shampoo hai, ya cream hai, jo bhi hai. I didn't feel that I have missed that. Or for that example, if it delivers similarly like a car, whether it's an EV or not, or whether it's, you know, any other product. So if the functionality is delivered, and if we have an ecosystem to kind of tell you that, you know, this is how maybe Amrita experienced it, and she comes and tells you, your neighbor does it, your friend does it, your cousin does it, your relative does it, whoever, your entire school, college, university, office, everyone does it. So that ecosystem will actually become the voice of adoption because your trust will increase only then that yes, this green product delivers equally or more than another product which is not so green and then people would be willing to pay the premium. But I think they need the confidence in the product first and then the whole ecosystem. So it's our responsibility, you know, as manufacturers, producers, as organizations, to kind of create that education, number one, that yes, this green product is really better. It's not just a green certification, but it's really better. It really delivers on the functionality and the usability which you are getting, the experience that you are getting as a consumer with any other non-green product. And then once you see multiple people adopting, you are empowered. So it's education, it's empowerment, and then you get enabled actually by that whole community of people around you who are saying and you are seeing, they are saying and you are seeing that how these products are able to deliver as good or sometimes even better, but definitely not worse. And then there'll be no question of cost, I think. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. I know we are on top of time. I just uh, asked no, no Q&A, but thank you very much for uh, all the panelists. At least for me, it was an enriching experience to understand uh, sustainability across areas, right? We rarely get, we get to hear, you know, one or two kind of products, but it's a great experience to know what's happening behind the wall, what is the experience, you know, we need the right product, that's the first thing. Functionality is important, and then different solutions, how to make it happen, right? So, we, you know, thank you, thank you very much. It was a great uh, experience for me. Hopefully, you also enjoyed. Thank you all. <laughs>